Good morning. I'm Tom Davis, Director of Health Programs for Food for the Hungry. I wanted to talk to you today about barrier analysis, one of the tools that Food for the Hungry uses in our prevention of under two malnutrition projects, as well as our other child survival and health programs. Barrier analysis is one of the main tools that we use in most of our health and nutrition programs. Barrier analysis studies help staff to better understand how to successfully promote behavior change by identifying the most important barriers and promoters of key food security behaviors. Now, while I'll be talking today mostly about health and nutrition examples, barrier analysis can be used on a wide array of different behaviors. Pretty much anything where you're promoting that someone else adopt a behavior, barrier analysis can help you to understand those barriers and promoters of the behavior. If you haven't heard about barrier analysis before, it's basically a rapid assessment tool to identify behavioral determinants associated with a particular behavior, for example, exclusive breastfeeding, so that you can develop more effective behavior change communication messages and also activities. Those doing a behavior, the doers, are compared with those who are not doing a behavior, the non-doers, so that the most important behavioral determinants can be identified. Uh, some of the different behavioral determinants that are examined with barrier analysis are perceived severity and perceived susceptibility, perceived action efficacy and perception of divine will, cues for action and perceived social acceptability, and perceived self-efficacy and positive and negative attributes. And we'll be talking about each of those a bit later. So with barrier analysis, we ask a series of questions to identify eight potential determinants can block people from taking positive action and also perceived positive attributes of behavior that can be used to promote it. Let me give you a bit of background on the method. It was developed out of the need for a standardized tool to discover determinants of key behaviors promoted in health projects and nutrition programs in developing countries. I developed this back in 1990 working in the Dominican Republic and since then uh, the methodology has been disseminated by the core social and behavior change working group. And since then it's been used by many PBOs, uh, researchers, uh, graduate students around different behaviors and some domestic use as well. For example, it was used by the Baltimore city government to look at use of trash cans. Uh, it's designed use, uh, using two main theories from the scientific literature on behavior change, the health belief model and also the theory of reasoned action. Now, if you're not a public health person, you've probably not heard of the health belief model. But basically this uh, model, which tries to describe why people change and how people change, focuses on six determinants. Perceived susceptibility, which is also known as perceived threat, perceived severity, perceived benefits, including perceived action efficacy and the advantages of the, uh, uh, of the behavior, the action. Perceived barriers, uh, which we often refer to as negative attributes of the action, things that make it more difficult to do the behavior. Cues for action, things that help you to remember it and to remember to do it and how to do it. And also perceived self-efficacy. I also use the theory of reason action to develop this, uh, this tool. Uh, that suggests that a person's behavior is determined in addition to attitudes and behavioral intention by his or her subjective norm. Now the subjective norm is defined as a person's perception that most people are important to him or her think that he should or should not perform the behavior in question. Uh, we call this perceived social acceptability. There's one other determinant uh, that Food for the Hungry decided uh, that we would add to this model, and that's from a realization from our program experience of the importance of people's perception of divine uh, God's or the God's will as a motivator for their behavior. So often in addition to what other people around them think, uh, they, they look to their own faith and are trying to decide what are the things that they believe that God or the gods would like them to do. Uh, and that's another reason, uh, that's a reason we've decided to include this as well, and we found it to be important uh, for many behaviors. Now, we made modifications to this methodology. Um, this has been in, uh, more recently. Uh, looking at uh, AED's doer non doer analysis tool, and we decided to begin uh, looking at these different determinants and barrier analysis, comparing the responses of the people who do a behavior, the doers, with those who do not do the behavior, the non-doers. That can be very useful in identifying the most important barriers. So uh, 
do or not do or analysis actually included in, as part of barrier analysis. Barrier analysis is bigger than do or not do or analysis. It includes uh, questions on uh, some other important determinants that are not included in that type of analysis. Uh, but we definitely owe a debt to AED for coming up with do or non doer, which we've integrated into this now. Here's the reason that it's important to compare doers and non doers when looking at determinants of behavior. This is from a condom survey done by AIDSCOM in the Eastern Car uh, Caribbean in 1991. And from KPC data, you could see, for example, that 25% of you said that AIDS is mostly transmitted by heterosexual sex. So they had a problem with perceived susceptibility. 95% um, said, I know how to use condoms, so perceived self-efficacy didn't seem to be a problem. 53% said, my friends approve. 45% uh, said, my boy uh, or girlfriend will stay with me, so in the perceived consequences area. Now, looking at this, you might uh, say, well, the real problem that we need to work on is perceived susceptibility. It's the lowest one. Uh, it's what we should devote our most time to because that seems to be driving the behavior. But is it really? This is from that same project, now comparing the doers, who are the red bars, those are youth who are using condoms, to the non-doers, the blue bars, youth who are not using condoms. And looking at this graph, you can see that uh, while their uh, perceived susceptibility is low, it's actually low amongst people who are using condoms and not using condoms. And for that reason, it doesn't appear to be what is driving condom use uh, and adoption of condoms. Instead, it's probably these two. Perceived social norms, a big difference. 68% of those using condoms said my friends approve, where only 38% of the non-doers said so. And perceived consequences. 56% of those using condoms said my boy or girlfriend will stay with me if I use condoms, where only a third of the non-doers said it. So that's one important reason that you can't just take your KPC data or other cross-sectional data and come up with the best messages. You need to use some tool that's going to allow you to compare the doers and the non-doers to see the differences between those two groups. And barrier analysis is a, a great tool for doing that. As I said, this is a rapid uh, methodology. Uh, once people are trained, and often we'll do a, a training that might last a day or, uh, or two days, it often would be part of the Designing for Behavior Change curricula, which goes into a lot of other things. Uh, that training is six days long total. But to, if you have two people, uh, it will probably take you about a day or two for each behavior that you're studying. And we often will only focus on maybe the top three or four behaviors that we think are really driving uh, the impact. For a larger group, more behaviors can be done in the uh, same amount of time if you have more people because you'll have more interviewers. And with the sample size, we found that uh, 45 doers versus 45 non-doers usually generates enough management information and avoids having a lot of useless, statistically significant differences that have very small odds ratios. So if you find that, for example, doers are 10% more likely to do something than non-doers, I'm really not interested in finding that out. I would like to see things where uh, doers are two or three times more likely to be doing something. Uh, using this size sample, 45 doers, 45 non-doers, uh, we've been very happy with the results we've seen across organizations in using that sample size. And I'll, uh, in terms of factors influence our decisions about behaviors, some of the terminology we'll use, uh, I'm going to speak about preventive action. That's an action or behavior that can prevent disease, uh, prevent problems like agricultural problems, et cetera. It's not necessarily a health behavior. Uh, th sorry, this preventive action is any sort of behavior that you're promoting that can help prevent some other problem. Uh, in terms of which behavior to choose, we choose one that's key to program success and or has been difficult to change in the past. So we'll look at our KPC uh, and see uh, what, what's a behavior that some people are practicing, but it's still quite low, say under 20 or 25 percent, and we'd like to scale it up. And it's something that we think will have a lot of impact, like exclusive breastfeeding is one we've used, knowing that proper breastfeeding practices can avert about 13 percent of all child deaths. Um, so that's another thing that goes into it. Also, some of us will look back at our program results, and if we see something that we tried to change in the past and we were unable to really have very much movement in that indicator, that's one would, uh, that we decide to do um, barrier analysis around. Okay, so when doing a behavior, which do you think is more important? Your motivation to do it or the absence of things that block you from doing it? Well, both can be. 
It's really both. If you don't have the motivation to do something, you won't be doing it. But also, if you even if you have a lot of motivation, for example, for losing weight and quitting smoking, but there are a lot of things that block you from doing it, often you won't see a change. When I taught this to health promoters in the Dominican Republic many years ago, we actually used a, a physical scale that looked like this, showing them how that all these different uh, determinants on the left side, which would go through and explain to them, will really push the decision towards a no in terms of doing the behavior. If any of those, are, those barriers are present, but these positive attributes of an action are people that support you in doing uh, the behavior, um, the advantages of doing it, those are things that will push you towards a yes in terms of doing the behavior. Since you might not be um, familiar with all of these determinants, I'll give you a bit of background. Uh, the first one that we talk about is perceived susceptibility. Basically, that is, could that problem happen to me? So if people think that they cannot get a particular disease or their crops couldn't get a particular disease or have a particular problem, uh, they're less likely to take action to prevent it. They feel like they have some vulner, uh, they do not have vulnerability to it. Uh, so this looks as, could that problem happen to me? Next is perceived severity. This is, is the problem very serious? If people do not think that a problem or a disease is serious or annoying, then they're a lot less likely to take any sort of action to prevent it. Next is perceived action efficacy. Does the preventive action work? And not does it work, but does the person believe that it can work? That's why the word perceived is in front of a lot of these determinants. It's what's happening in the person's head that's really important. So do they believe that the preventive action works? And if people think that the preventive action that you're promoting does not work to prevent the problem or disease uh, uh, in question, then they're a lot less likely to do it. This is a very important one, perceived social acceptability. Is the preventive action socially acceptable? Do people around me uh, think that one should do this or that I should do this? If someone thinks that their neighbors or family or other people important to them would criticize them for adopting a particular health practice or a particular agriculture practice, they're a lot less likely to do it. This is another determinant that we see over and over coming up as an important determinant is perceived self-efficacy. Is it easy to do, especially in terms of skills, money, and time? If a person thinks that an action is too difficult for them to do, he or she is less likely to do it. And that includes having the required knowledge or skills and also the cost to them in terms of time and money. Another one is, can I remember to do it? Cues for action. Often there's a behavior that we're very committed to doing, we really want to do, and we simply have trouble remembering to do it or how to do it. So it's whether or not the person can remember the preventive action or when to do the action. If someone can't remember to do it or can't even remember the action itself, then their opinion about the action matters little. Next is perception of divine will. Is it God's will or the God's will uh, in polytheistic cultures that I, A, should not have the problem or B, that I overcome the problem? If someone believes that it's not God's will that they avoid the problem or to be released from a problem or disease, then they're probably going to do, uh, be less likely to do anything to try to uh, avoid it or to be cured of it or released from it themselves. And then there are negative and positive attributes associated with the action. And when talking about this, let's remember that these attributes don't necessarily have to do uh, with health or nutrition or agriculture. For example, at one point, um, uh, when they were trying to get people to brush teeth, uh, for the longest time they would talk about one of the attributes was that it would help you to avoid cavities or caries. But then they realized they could sell a lot more toothpaste and have more people brushing their teeth if they talked about being kissable um, and, and having fresher breath if you brushed your teeth. So it's whatever is important to that person um, in, in a general way, not necessarily specific to what we're interested in. Uh, so attributes are characteristics in addition to the other seven determinants that may not have anything to do with health or community development outcomes, but may have to do with personal preferences and tastes.
We don't have time today to discuss how to create the questionnaires, uh, but if you're uh, interested in that, uh, feel free to contact me. We do have questionnaires on quite a few behaviors, and other organizations that have used this have questionnaires. And we also have some written material uh, that's included in the Barrier Analysis Manual at barrieranalysis.fhi.net. You can download that, and it uh, describes how to create the questionnaires. Now, in terms of interpreting BA data, once your interviewers have gone out and interviewed the 45 doers and non-doers, uh, you're going to do an exercise where they tabulate the data, saying how many people said each response. Uh, and then you're going to take that data and plug it into an Excel sheet that we've created, which calculates odds ratios and p-values. Now, when the doers and non-doers have similar percentages for any item, the odds ratio is going to be closer to 1, say, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And the p-value is going to be greater than 0.05. Those items are not likely to be important determinant of the behavior. Instead, you're going to look for uh, items where the doers and non-doers have very dissimilar percentages for any item. The odds ratio will be further from 1, either above 1, like 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, or 2 or 3, or below that, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, uh, further away from 1. The p-value should be less than 0.05, uh, and those items uh, are more likely to be an important determinant of the behavior. And I'll show you how to look at the Excel sheet to determine that. Uh, while we use 0.05, after we've listed our uh, significant, statistically significant findings for barrier analysis, sometimes we'll go back through and look where there are others that maybe had a p-value that's above 0.05, say less than 0.1. Um, those you could still list and say these, these may be important determinants, even though uh, there's less chance. That means there's a 10% chance that that finding was due to chance, but um, uh, so we usually use a 0.05 level. Now, the ability to definitively talk about important determinants is largely based on the level of associations. So you look for relatively large odds ratios uh, that, are, uh, that show a p-value of less than 0.05. So this is what the spreadsheet looks like. Up at the very top, uh, which isn't shown here, you'd plug in your number of doers and non-doers. And then you have uh, those two columns with numbers in them like 22 and 38 for Mother Takes Balance Diet. Uh, that's where you plug in how many uh, non-doers mention that response for the question, what would make it easier uh, for you to exclusively breastfeed? Uh, the doers said 38 of them said that. Uh, 22 of the uh, non-doers said the Mother Takes a Balance Diet. And then what you do is scan down this p-value column over here. And we made it easy by having those uh, show up in, actually, it's blue font on the Excel uh, table. Um, for example, here's one that's below 0.05 uh, that shows in a different color. And then you look back at the odds ratio. It's 0.18. Now, if you look at the bottom here, I've noted that an odds ratio that's less than 1 means that it's protective against the disease or problem that you were evaluating against. And the odds ratio above one means it's not protective, that's harmful. It's basically, basically positively associated with the disease or problem. So if I wanted to express this in terms of how much more likely is it, um, uh, if I want to talk about this, often what I'll do is take the inverse. So I'd take one divided by that 0.18 and I get 5.6. And then I would say um, mothers who said, that it's uh, that it makes it easier for her to exclusively breastfeed if she takes a balanced diet. Uh, those mothers are, are more likely to be exclusively breastfeeding, 5.6 times more likely to be exclusively breastfeeding. So it's, uh, it takes a little bit of work uh, to learn. So how do you express the results of this? But hopefully this spreadsheet will make it easier than it gives you both the odds ratio and the p-value. Notice for the husband and the mother-in-law, those both have p-values above 0.05, so you would disregard them. And then below, people who said that friends, aunts, brothers, sisters, or parents would approve, we actually grouped those together uh, to look for an association. And we found that that one was significant as well. And it's 0.24. And if you take the inverse of that, it's going to be about 4. So you would say people that said that friends, aunts, brothers, sisters, and parents approved were four times more likely to be exclusively breastfeeding. Now, there are a number of different ways you can use this when you're interpreting the barrier analysis data. One is that doers' responses may include ideas for strategies on how to make the behavior easier or more appealing to people, uh, your target group especially, and can provide clues for messages to non-doers as well to try to get them uh, to begin adopting the behavior. So you should, should examine those carefully. 
Also, sometimes more doers list a particular disadvantage of the behavior than non-doers. That's good to note, and not in terms of how to get someone to adopt the behavior, but for future promotion of behavior maintenance. Once you get someone to do the behavior, it helps you to know what are those things that doers now know is difficult about this that maybe they didn't know before they adopted the behavior, so that you can help them to deal with those problems that come up. And lastly, looking at differences between doers and non-doers as to who approves or disapproves of the behavior may provide important information on who to target for your intervention. Let's look at some actual uh, uh, barrier analysis data from a project. This is from uh, Food for the Hungry's USAID-funded Expanded Impact Child Survival Program in Mozambique, uh, funded by the USAID Child Survival and Health Grants Program. And this was done in Safala Province in May 2007. Uh, near the beginning of the project. And uh, we did this on exclusive breastfeeding. In our baseline KPC survey, we found that only 17% of infants zero to five months of age were exclusive, exclusively breastfed in the last 24 hours. So that's why we decided to do barrier analysis uh, to look at that particular behavior. Here's one of the um, things that we found from barrier analysis. When we ask who would approve of exclusively breastfeeding, you'll see that 58% of uh, the mothers of the doers, those exclusively breastfeeding now, said that friends, aunts, brothers, and sisters, and parents, or parents uh, approved of it, where only 24% of the non-doers mentioned that. Uh, it's an open-ended question, by the way. And then on the other converse of that, when uh, we ask who would approve of it, uh, the percentage you said nobody would approve, there's only 20% of the, of the doers said that, where 51% of the non-doers said that. So uh, we use that in our care groups uh, where we're doing health promotion. Care groups uh, include all pregnant women and uh, women with small children under two in a community. Messages are delivered to the household and are received by all household members. And this way, social norms are changed. So knowing that this was important, the research informed who we should target, that we uh, we took that uh, and used it by explaining to our leader mothers in the care groups that when you go out and do education, especially around exclusive breastfeeding, you need to get as many of those other people important to the mother in that, uh, in that talk. Uh, sometimes they would do uh, talks with them separately. Sometimes it would be at the household level that you call in the grandmother or mother-in-law. In this case, it would be friends, aunts, brothers. Try to get some of those people um, uh, so you're doing your health promotion as well and trying to reach them outside of that home visit. Here's another example. When we asked what are the advantages to exclusive breastfeeding, uh, we found that 18% uh, of the doers said it's less expensive versus only 4% of the non-doers. And then uh, uh, on the converse of that, none of the uh, exclusive breastfeeders said there's no advantage to it at all, where 42% of the non-doers said they couldn't think of a single advantage. Um, so we emphasize low cost and other advantages during our discussions uh, about advantages of breastfeeding. We're sure to use those ones that they brought up and also make sure they understood a number of different advantages to them and their child in doing this. Another one that came up with that is they said that the child grows well. That had a p-value of 0.06, so not quite significant, uh, but that was another advantage that they meant. When we ask mothers, what makes it easier for you to exclusively breastfeed? 84% of the doers, those exclusively breastfeeding said, if I took, if uh, I take a balanced diet, or if a mother has a balanced diet, it helps her to do this. Where only 49% of the non-doers said that. So uh, one of our messages was that, bre it was that breastfeeding mothers should try to eat an extra balanced meal every day. But also saying any mother can exclusively, exclusively breastfeed. It doesn't matter what you're eating. Uh, you can do this uh, so that we could correct that idea that unless I get a really good diet, I, I can't even do this behavior. Another, uh, some of the other determinants we found was perceived self-efficacy. That was a very large difference. Perceived social norms, the general idea of the, of the people, the majority of the people I know support me in doing this. And also perceived of unwill. Very large difference in terms of the doers saying that they believe that God wanted them to do this. It's something that God uh, supported. Uh, versus 69% uh, for that, where the non-doers, only 29% said that. One way that you could use that sort of data is by um, talking to pastors, imams, others in the area to uh, be able to include messages on exclusive breastfeeding when they meet with groups in the church. Because as uh, representatives uh, of their faith, 
they're able to have some influence on that determinant. This question doesn't really fit with one of uh, the eight determinants, but just to give you an idea, sometimes you'll be reading something and realizing there are other important determinants out there. Feel free to put those in your barrier analysis questionnaire as well. For example, in Food for the Hungry, the more we studied motivational interviewing, uh, we realized the question about how important does someone think the behavior is, that can be a determinant as well. So we asked mothers this and found that 89% uh, of the uh, doers said that it, it was very important versus only 53. So we knew we had to increase uh, the level of importance that mothers assigned exclusively breastfeeding. Now when you get these results, barrier analysis suggests interventions at multiple levels. It's not just at the, the individual or household level. For example, at the individual level, you often think of changes that are needed in terms of knowledge or attitudes and the way we think that can lead to behavior change. Or it might also be supplies, like having stickers to remind people to wash your hands, or providing ORS packets at the household level. If a mother has a, a spare ORS packet, it might make it easier for to use ORS. If you found that in a study, that would be something you might change at the household level. At the family level, um, also changes needed in terms of support of husbands, grandmothers, mother-in-laws, uh, maybe encourage for behavior, behavior change, or a willingness to cook differently. Uh, if it's one person cooking in the house for others, uh, you, and, and that person is not the, uh, the main person you've been talking to, you would need to work on their behavior uh, to cook differently as well. At the community level, it could be things like changes needed in messages or ideas and services coming out of health facilities or out of churches or mosques uh, or other religious institutions, uh, leaders, and the advocacy that they do on behalf of their communities. And then it can also affect policy changes in terms of changes needed in health facility policies. Now, like maybe you do barrier analysis and in terms of what would make it easier, the mother might say, well, if the clinic was open more than three days a week, I'd be more likely to do this behavior. Or um, if they were willing to open up a new vial of vaccine when I go in uh, with my child when he's sick, I'd be more likely to vaccinate my child because I can't always make it to the vaccination post. Uh, that's an example of a change in a health facility policy. Also, availability and, of support and resources that create a positive environment for change. Uh, so don't just think about the individual and family levels in terms of interventions uh, that could be affected by barrier analysis. Let's talk a bit more, uh, uh, briefly a bit more about using the results. So after you have those results, it helps you to decide what changes are needed in your program design and the behavior change messages you'll use, and also in the groups or audiences that you'll target. Uh, you need to decide how to monitor changes in the determinants during the life of the project too. For example, we might have an indicator that would be percentage of mothers who believe that they're able to exclusively breastfeed. If we found a problem with uh, self-efficacy uh, around exclusive breastfeeding, that's an indicator you could monitor over time to see if you're actually changing it through the actions that you're putting in place as a result of the study. And also, you can use the Designing for Behavior Change framework to organize actions, and we'll uh, talk a bit more about that in a second. So here's a summary of what we found in the Mozambique Barrier Analysis on Exclusive Breastfeeding. For example, mothers of infants who did not say nothing makes it easier to exclusively breastfeed were 8.2 times more likely to do it. Mothers who said, I can exclusively breastfeed with my current knowledge and skills, that's perceived self-efficacy, were 7.4 times more likely to do it. Uh, mothers who said that exclusive breastfeeding is very important to me were seven times more likely to exclusively breastfeed. Uh, mothers who said having a balanced diet makes it easier to, uh, to do it were 5.7 times more likely to. Mothers who said God approves of me exclusively breastfeeding were five times more likely. Mothers who said exclusive breastfeeding is less expensive were four and a half times more likely. Mothers who said friends or extended family approve or would approve of the exclusive breastfeeding were four point times more likely to do it. And mothers who said most people approve or would approve of me exclusively breastfeeding, depending on the wording depends on if you're talking to doers or non-doers, uh, were 3.4 times. So we'll make a table like this and rank them by odds ratio to sort of help us remember which of these uh, determinants uh, seem to have more um, impact in terms of the behavior. So when we're doing uh, a barrier analysis training as a standalone or the uh, core groups designing for behavior change training, we'll fill out this framework along the way. 
And we start on the left-hand side with the behavior and say in order to promote exclusive breastfeeding among children uh, less than six months of uh, age, uh, we're going to promote uh, work with this audience group of mothers of children zero to 23 months of age. And we're going to research uh, these key determinants. And so you list the determinants that you included in your questionnaire, most likely all of them. Uh, and we actually have bolded the ones that we found to be uh, uh, significant in Mozambique after we collected the data. And then we're going to address these key factors based on what we found about these determinants. For example, that not all mothers believe that they can exclusively breastfeed, especially if they have a child who is sick or if they're not eating a balanced diet. Uh, and mother, not all mothers realize that they can exclusively breastfeed. I, if they do it, uh, they can save them money. Uh, not all of, them, all of them believe that their extended family members support them exclusively breastfeeding. Not all of them believe that God is in favor of their exclusively breastfeeding. And not all of them realize that exclusively breastfeeding will help their child avoid diarrhea. And not all, all of them believe that exclusive breastfeeding is important. So those are the things that we found in this study. And then we come up with a list of activities and messages here. And we say, because of this, we're going to use the messages. And this program, it was through 4,830 leader mothers in the care groups. Uh, one of them would be that exclusive breastfeeding is important. We talk about disease prevention, immune effects, and mental development, uh, reasons to breastfeed. That you can exclusively breast, uh, breastfeed successfully, even if you do not change your diet. And that exclusive breastfeeding can save you money. Uh, and that it, uh, mothers should eat an extra meal each day while uh, uh, breastfeeding. We also, and uh, we had other messages, but that's just some of the messages that came out of this. And also strategies like convincing extended family members of the value of exclusive breastfeeding and having them encourage mothers to do it. Uh, showing community support for exclusive breastfeeding to work on those uh, that social acceptability determinant. Uh, like having communities come up with declarations that they read, maybe at public gatherings, that they support this. And having clergy promote exclusive breastfeeding, knowing that uh, divine will was one of the determinants, uh, like giving them sermon guides on God giving us what we need, and that includes uh, breast milk for the child for the first six months of life. And maybe posters, for example, saying you can do it, anyone can exclusively breastfeed, and then giving some other advice with that. So this is what we, uh, those are the things we put into place as a result of our very analysis studies in Mozambique. And here's the result of what we saw in terms of behavior change. Uh, baseline, as I said, only 17% of mothers of children uh, zero to five months were exclusively breastfeeding. Um, as of May 2006, uh, we started in uh, April of 2006. It already had jumped to 67% of those uh, were doing it. Uh, in September of 2007, 75% were exclusively breastfeeding, and in December 2007, 95% were exclusively breastfeeding. So uh, some of that change undoubtedly occurred before we did um, uh, uh, our promotion of exclusive breastfeeding. We, we've seen that sometime at care groups where just getting mothers into groups, it seems like uh, it, it, they start making changes in their life of things that they've heard were good for them for quite a while. Uh, we think that could be due to just some changes in generalized self-efficacy uh, that mothers have when they have someone that starts coming to visit them very often or they're involved in a group. But nonetheless, uh, you can see this large change in exclusive breastfeeding over the life of this project for one of the behaviors that we used uh, uh, barrier analysis in. We also did it for hand washing with soap, for example. That uh, increased dramatically from uh, right around 1% of mothers stating four times when they uh, wash their hands with soap at baseline up to um, over 95% uh, by midterm. And we have no doubt that these large increases in exclusive breastfeeding also helped in lowering the underweight prevalence. Um, at February 2006, the uh, underweight, uh, there were 26.8% of the children who were underweight uh, in this project. Uh, in September 2007, when we returned to Den Anthropometry, it had dropped to 15.6, um, and that's a weighted average. And uh, in September 2008, it remained at 15.6% of children underweight. So that's a 42% reduction in underweight seen in this project uh, in a very short period of time. Thanks for your patience. I hope there's some things you learned today. Uh, if you have questions about uh, this approach, uh, feel free to call, uh, contact me or Metsy Handled at Food for the Hungry. Um, we also would like to thank the core group uh, for everything that they've done to help disseminate this and other innovations in child survival and community health. Thank you very much.